Bob uh, from Green about the cosmic web, but uh, this lecture will be focused on the cosmic web from the point of view of galaxy formation and how uh, the cosmic web environment shapes um, galaxy formation. So maybe before starting, um, who is working on galaxy formation here or on, on something related to galaxies? Okay. <laughs> okay, good, thank you. Um, and also before starting, I, I prefer that you ask questions during the talk than everything at the end, so please don't hesitate to interrupt me. Um, I think it might be better this way uh, instead of keeping your question until the end of the talk. So what you see here, this is a 3D rendering of uh, the horizon, I mean a very small part of the horizon region hyperdynamical simulation. Um, and what we see on this picture, which is maybe uh, three megaparsec uh, wide. Um, so what we see is the density field, which is color coded from blue to red. So red are the high density region. Um, on top of the density field, we have these white lines here, um, which are which represent the skeleton, like the density ridges. Um, this is the location of the cosmic wave filaments you heard about. And I have also represented on this picture a uh, field line, which are the velocity field line, um, which are these streamlines lines here. And although this might not be uh, visible uh, on the screen, but this field line, velocity field line, are color coded by vorticity. So when they are whiter, it means that um, matter is rotating uh, more strongly with a coherent uh, rotational motion. And on top of that, I have added these small spheres, which are the halos. And those, in, in this halo, uh, we have galaxies, okay? And you see that uh, depending on the location of these halos, and therefore of the galaxies, in the cosmic web, um, they will be in different density environment. Um, so the, the content of the gas reservoir will be different. And therefore, the gas which will be accreting on to the galaxy into the halo will have different properties. And this is likely to shape the stellar formation within the galaxy uh, inside the halo. And so this is what we are going to discuss uh, today and tomorrow. Okay, before going uh, deep into the... Yeah, okay. Before uh, discussing all this, I just wanted to make a short, uh, brief landscape of what is uh, research in astrophysics in France, um, because some of you might be uh, looking for PhD or looking for postdoc and might be interested in, in coming to France. Um, so this is a very brief and incomplete overview. Um, so in France, we have about 35 observatories and research institutes across the, the entire uh, country and about uh, 700 permanent researchers working on uh, astronomy or cosmology. Um, this might be not very really accurate numbers, okay, I, I look into the French Astronomical Society website to find them, but please give a rough idea. Um, and we have different permanent positions in France, uh, some researchers are doing anti-only research, um, and some others are teaching, and about 60% of the researchers in France um, are, are also teaching um, to some extent. Uh, we have, I guess, more than 70, uh, 70 new PhD students each year. Um, 50 of them are located in the Paris area, so maybe this 70 is not accurate, maybe this is more. But I just found this number and I know that the doctoral school in Paris is the largest uh, by far from other doctoral school, uh, school in France. So. And among these uh, new PhD students, one third are for foreign students. Uh, so you, you might be interested in applying for PhD in France, and that's, that's possible. Um, things are a bit less bright in terms of uh, hiring uh, and new people hired on permanent position, because we have uh, over the entire France, um, for the entire country, we have only 10 to 15 I guess, a uh, new permanent position uh, in France. Uh, in France, we have also some uh, working observatories, which are used for science, so I put some here. 
um, if the Midi in the south of France, in the Pyrenees, old Provence Observatory, also in south of France, but more uh, here. Um, Noema, which is a interferometer in the Alps here. And uh, we have the North Sea radio telescope in, in the middle of, the front, of France. Now, just one word about the Institut d'Astrophysique de Paris, where I work. Um, this is a very active institute, which is located in the Paris city center. Um, People in the institute are involved in several large programs, uh, like, for example, the UK, but we have also people working on Gino uh, University, Cosmos, and uh, others, uh, other surveys as well, which are not cited here. And within the institute, we have several research groups uh, related, I mean, on topics related to extragalactic astrophysics, uh, taken as a broad uh, topic. So large-scale structure, formation of galaxies, high-energy physics, and theoretical cosmology. And so in Paris, in the, at the Institute of Physics de Paris, we have also our very own observatory. So this is uh, an observatory in the city center, so that's quite amazing. So here, this is a dome um, on top of the IAP, um, and we have a telescope which is working, and that we use for teaching. Uh, but we cannot, I mean, Obviously, we are very polluted by, uh, by the city, so we cannot observe uh, much, but we can, for teaching, we can still observe like nebula uh, in our uh, imaging. Okay, so now I will give a brief overview of uh, why uh, I think the topic I will discuss is important. Um, so you heard about Euclid, huh? Uh, talked about it. Um, so Euclid will be this very uh, wide field mission which will image um, a very large fraction of the sky, of the celestial sphere. Um, so you might have heard that the launch readiness will be next year and then it, it might be launched um, in, I mean, after this date. It will be launched after this date, but at least it, it will be launched within really next year. Um, so this is very soon. Um, with Euclid, we will image, uh, so I, I say here, almost every Milky Way-like galaxy that is to observe in the recent universe. Um, this is not overstated. So here I just give you um, a quantitative idea of that. What we see here is the stellar mass limit of the survey. Um, as a function of redshift. Um, so the, in blue, this is with a selection in optical imaging with Euclid at the depth of Euclid, so 24.5 uh, um, AB magnitude. In red, this is a selection in the near infrared with Euclid, um, in green, in the optical with LSST. Well, let's say, let's uh, take, for example, the red. Uh, line here, so the selection in the near infrared. Um, with this selection, you can see that a uh, few giga years after the Big Bang, for example at Redshift 3, we will observe all the galaxies more massive than 10 to the uh, 10.3 or something like that. Okay? So we will uh, observe a huge amount of galaxies and down to relatively low mass. So we have a very, uh, very large amount of data that this will be a gold mine for um, studying, uh, so obviously for cosmology, which is the core science of the mission, but also for galaxies, uh, sci for galaxy science. Um, despite this um, huge amount of data, so that we will have with Euclid, but we have already a lot of surveys, um, uh, of galaxy surveys. Yet, there are very some basic questions that we do not understand about uh, galaxy formation. So obviously, we, we understand the, the, the broad idea of galaxy formation, of star formation. We, we know some quenching mechanism which can uh, extinguish the star formation within galaxy. Uh, but still, for example, we don't know uh, quantitatively what really drives the abundance of passive and star forming galaxies across um, cosmic time. To give you an illustration of this um, ignorance, I show this plot. 
Um, and what you see here is what we call the main sequence. So this is the star formation rate in log unit. So the amount of stellar mass formed per year in galaxies as a function of the stellar mass of those galaxies. And uh, we have this uh, sequence here that we call the main sequence. And uh, galaxies which form star uh, uh, follow this main sequence. Um, and then there are some galaxies which do not follow the main sequence for which the star formation uh, is very low in these galaxies that we call the passive galaxies, the passive population. Um, so those, the star formation in these galaxies uh, has been quenched by some processes or a combination of processes that um, I will discuss later. Um, those three panels are for three hydro simulations, state-of-the-art simulation, uh, relatively big volume, like. Uh, boxes of 100 megaparsecs side or something like that. Um, and you see that from one simulation to the other, although this main sequence is relatively well reproduced, the population of passive galaxies is very different. So those galaxies which do not follow the main sequence, they have a different amount of residual star formation, different masses. Okay, if we look at the histogram, uh, the different colors histogram, they are very different. Um, and this is very uh, surprising because uh, part of this simulation is calibrated actually to reproduce the observation in the broad sense. Okay, so we have much, I mean, we have fitted some um, uh, subgrid recipes like uh, energy injected by AGN or energy injected by supernova, etc. So that, broadly speaking, we reproduce uh, the main trend in observation at redshift zero. But if we look at higher redshift, well, we see that. Uh, we have different results and we do not reproduce the observation which are the gray histogram here. So there is uh, a significant mismatch that we still don't understand. So which means that there is something that we miss um, if we want to understand galaxy formation. Um, and we don't know really what. Is it just that uh, the, the feedback, so the energy injected by uh, AGN or supernova is not well reproduced? Yes. So there's uh, points at the bottom. Is there some systematic error or here? Ah, yeah. okay. This is a good question. This is because of the discretization of the dis discretization of the star formation rate in the simulation. So we cannot go. Uh, I mean, because it's either zero or a step. Okay. okay. So there is something that we miss, and maybe to understand what we miss, well, we should replace the galaxies in the cosmological landscape, um, which is uh, the cosmic wave that you heard about uh, by Rin, uh, these uh, previous days. So this is what we are going to do uh, in this lecture. So these lectures are about galaxies. Many of you are not really working on galaxies, but cosmology. Um, but stay here, um, because if we, so cosmology, I mean, if we want to uh, check that, for example, the cosmological model is correct, we need to rely on some tracer of the density field. I mean, the, there are different tracers, but galaxies is one of the main tracers that we can use. Um, and to, to do that, we need to understand a bit of galaxy. I will just give this example, which is the example of intrinsic alignment. Um, I don't know if Hank has discussed this before already or not, but um, so uh, Rin talked uh, yesterday about the alignment of halos with the large scale cosmic wave. And so if the halos are, um, and so the galaxy inside the halo are aligned, for example, with the filament, so for example, if we have um, uh, these galaxies which have their uh, spin aligned with filament, there will be maybe like that, okay? And we can maybe have the most massive galaxies which are flipped and which are maybe elongated in the direction of the filament. And you see that those galaxies are not only aligned with the large scale structure but also aligned together. And this is very annoying uh, when we do when we make dancing measurements. So this is what we call uh, the contamination by intrinsic alignment. And this needs to be understood, otherwise we will just um, um, bias the uh, measurement of cosmological parameters that we extract from the witnessing analysis. So this is what is shown on this slide. 
Um, so the red contours corresponds to uh, the constraint on some parameters when there are intrinsic alignments in the data, but those alignments are not uh, taken into account in the analysis. While the black contours are the two uh, correspond to the two uh, cosmological um, parameters, and you see that there is a, uh, a significant systematic if we do not account for these intrinsic if we do not model them in the analysis. And to model them, we need first to understand them. So that's why we need to understand the connection between uh, galaxies and, and uh, the cosmic wave. So intrinsic alignment is an example, but we need also to understand the relative abundance of red and blue galaxies uh, the, within the large scale density field. So the aims of these two lectures um, are the following. Um, first, I will try to provide you with a good understanding of what people are looking at when they study uh, the environment of galaxies. Um, and I will try to give you the state of the art uh, on this topic. So obviously this will be a biased view because this is uh, my understanding and this is biased towards my own uh, words. Um, and therefore, I really encourage further reading and I try to put a lot of references on the slides so that you can check other works and, and uh, build your own opinion on the topic. And I will try to help you re realize the underst that understanding the connection between galaxies and the large-scale environment is important also for, for cosmology. And I will discuss um, uh, um, at uh, least today, I will discuss the things from mostly from the point of view of an observer, in particular, I will discuss, discuss Peter's surveys. And tomorrow, I would like to propose um, uh, a small interactive answer session. Um, so, so, this is optional, so I mean, the best is that you bring your laptop and you can do the things um, in the room with me. I will do it on the screen and you can do it on your side. If you don't have a laptop, it's not a problem. You can just follow what I will do on the, on the screen. Um, but so, if you can bring your laptop uh, or be seated uh, close to someone who has a laptop, then it's good to have uh, this installation in place. So you can just take a picture and, and then do it um, tonight on, on your uh, uh, laptop. So this is very easy. Basically, we do just need this version of Python. And then, if you don't have it, this is how you can install it with a uh, mini conda. And then, uh, the other things that you need to do is to install PyDaisy. Uh, I will discuss more what is PyDaisy tomorrow, but you can check the documentation online. And you can already, um, if you want to get an idea of what we will do tomorrow during this interactive session, you can already check this link. Maybe I can open it uh, so that you see what it is about. This will bring you uh, on this web page. Uh, we do it full screen. And this is an interactive um, app where you can uh, investigate, explore the properties of the gas in cosmic wave filaments. Okay, so you have some visualization. Um, you can choose some small pieces of filament here. And so there are some parameters on the side left that you can adjust to select the filament and then what you can do is to compute stacked cross-section views so we can do it so these are cross-section uh, um, so we will cut a filament by a transverse plan okay and this will compute the cross-section i will explain more how these things are computed and then you can you can have an idea what's the 2d profile of the gas um, in the transverse plane across the filament so here is the result. Okay, uh, so there are some missing parts here because the connection is slow, I guess. But you are, we have four panels with four different properties, and yeah, and we will discuss it tomorrow. But you can already have a look uh, at this tonight if you want. <coughs> okay. Okay. So this is the main outline of the lecture. Um, today, what we are going to discuss is the K 
classical uh, view of uh, galaxy growth within the halo and the relation between galaxies and the local density. And then we will go one step further and look at observational probes of the cosmic web. And then we will uh, relate the galaxy properties to uh, the cosmic web, mostly from observational research. <clears throat> so let's start with uh, the stellar to halo mass relation and, um, and the relation between galaxies and the local density. So at each part of the talk, I, of the lecture, I put this uh, um, schedule of what we're going to discuss. I will not go through it each time, but I just put it for references. Um, the main question that we are going to discuss now is uh, where do the structures in our universe come from? So you already know about this because you heard about uh, Hint's talk. We just do a brief recap. And how galaxies relate, relate to the um, host halo and uh, density. So you have seen this kind of simulation before. Um, to understand galaxy formation, we need first to understand the halo formation. So um, just uh, looking at dark matter. So here you see um, cosmic web uh, uh, evolution through cosmic time. So this proto halo grow, grow from the initial um, density uh, uh, fluctuation. And the um, growth rate will be shaped by the cosmology. Um, I know that in the room there are people uh, working on galaxy mass function in different cosmologies. So, and indeed, the cosmology will shape uh, the mass of the halo and the growth rate because um, where the growth of this proto-halo will be a competition between uh, the gravity, so attraction of matter, and also uh, expansion of the universe. And this depends on the cosmological parameters. So this is something that we need to, to, to understand and to take into account. And then uh, at some point, so the perturbation grow, and at some point with a certain growth rate, and at some point, the proto-halo will decouple from the expansion of the universe and collapse um, when it reaches uh, the over density. And so the dark matter is collisionless, so it will not shock, and, but it will relax under reaching uh, the virialization. Okay? And under some assumption, we can, um, we can uh, analytically predict that uh, there is a universal profile of the halo, but this is making assumptions, for example, on the spherical the, on the symmetry itself. But then it's important to understand that even once they are realized, these halo are not isolated. They will keep accreting matter from these filaments they are connected to, and they will also merge along filaments, etc. So in fact, uh, the, the growth of this halo is a bit more complicated than, than what initially thought. Uh, we can predict what will be the mass function uh, under some specific uh, assumption. Um, if we do not make this assumption for the theoretical symmetry, then we, this is a very high dimensional problem. And the way to solve it is to run n body simulation um, to investigate what will be, the, for example, the mass function of the halo. Um, and we can uh, study some properties of halo. So these are um, the main properties that we might be interested in investigating, like their size, their profile, um, their angular momentum, internal structure, so the abundance of subhalo in them, for example, um, and the abundance as a function of mass and point correlation function. And these properties, well, they depend on cosmology, as I said, and uh, we make the point now that they also depend on the environment, because the environment will set the merger rate and also the accretion rate of this halo. <coughs> so just to give you an idea uh, on how cosmology shapes the mass function, this is some extreme, extreme case with uh, very different cosmology. Uh, so we have lambda CDN, but we have also uh, this open CDN is no dark energy but an open universe with the uh, omega matter of 0.3, I guess. Um, we have uh, SCDM, which is standard for dark matter, so omega matter equal 1, but no dark energy, and there is an evolving uh, um, universe with dark energy here. And I, I will not enter in the detail of this plot, but uh, the point that I want to make is that you get different mass functions if you switch from one cosmology to the other. But as I said, beside cosmology, what will shape the mass function will be uh, the environment. So why the environment could uh, impact uh, the abundance of halo at a given mass? 
Uh, the first obvious thing is that um, density, the amplitude of the density uh, will uh, um, impact the, the halo in this way. So here is a one-dimensional density field, okay? Um, so the y-axis is the amplitude of the density, the x-axis is, is just um, different perturbation. Um, and if we have a long wavelength density boost, so if we have this long wavelength mode density perturbation, we will boost uh, some of this fluctuation. And uh, this will make this over density to collapse earlier, and then this halo will form uh, earlier and will have time to be more massive. And then as a result, well, it is likely that we will find a more halo and more massive halo when we have uh, this uh, long uh, fluctuation in the density field. So for example, if we have a wall-like environment or a filament-like environment. So this is a very basic environmental effect. The amplitude of the density distribution is important for halo growth because of this uh, density boost. Um, now, the accretion rate onto the halo will uh, be shaped by the gravitational field surrounding the halo. And the density is not encoding everything about this gravitational field. Okay, so um, you remember the, the Poisson, Poisson equation which relates the uh, gravitational potential to the density field. which is uh, something like that. Okay, so this is the density contrast and this is the normalization. And so here we have the Laplacian of the gravitational potential, but this does not, does not tell everything about the gravitational potential. Okay? We also need to consider the full uh, tidal tensor. So basically this is the trace of the matrix of the Asian. Okay? And if we look at the full tidal tensor, we will uh, consider the other term on the matrix, so the non-diagonal term. Okay, so those terms. And which will quantify um, the relative uh, strength of the gravitational forces depending on the direction, basically. And uh, we can look at what's the effect of the tidal field on the accretion rate onto the hill. So I show here result um, by Marcelo Musso, uh, these are analytical pre prediction. Um, and the, so, as you heard from him this morning, actually, um, as I will uh, discuss now, um, the tidal tensor is actually shaped by the geometry of the density distribution. So, we are not only concerned by the amplitude of the density, but also by the distribution of the density in the neighborhood of the, stru the, the structure. So here you have a presentation of a filament. Okay, here this is the saddle point. Here that will be the node. Um, so let's take a slice, okay, like this, through this uh, visualization, and let's look at the accretion rate um, onto the halo, depending on the, the location in this filament. Um, so to start with. We can look, for example, at a node here, and we can look at halo of different masses which are at this node. And what you see is that uh, halo which are more massive will grow. So, okay, the color coding of this halo is the accretion rate. So, if it's darker, so the accretion rate is higher. And what you see is that at a node, um, more massive halo will grow faster than low mass halo. And basically, this is uh, because of the competition. You can see it this way. This is because of the competition between the, the protostructure and the, um, which is accreting some matter, but and the node of the cosmic web, this uh, large scale over density, um, which is also uh, accreting matter. And then we can look at halo of the same mass. So the size of the circle is the mass, but at different location. Okay, in this. Uh, in the cosmic web, and what we see is that a halo which is in a filament at a given mass uh, will have a lower accretion rate, so if it is close to the saddle here, will have a lower accretion rate than the halo at the node. Okay? So beyond the, what is driven by the amplitude of the density, 
The geometry of this density distribution is also important to understand the halo mass growth and uh, uh, to understand what shapes the halo mass function. And here I, I present uh, just to illustrate this without entering into detail. What we see is different halo mass function. Um, so this is the number of halo as a function of halo mass. Different panels are for different redshift and different colors of lines are for different density. Uh, and what we see is that well, uh, the, depending on the density, the amplitude of the mass function will be different, but not only the amplitude, also the slope of the mass function. Okay. And this is uh, an effect which is a combination of this, uh, what I discussed, so the amplitude of the density being different, but also the geometry of this density. So that's the first environmental effect. Um, and we we'll see that because it affects halos, it will also affect galaxies because galaxies are connected to the halos. So let's look a bit deeper onto the galaxy formation within this halo. Um, so the, in the same way that halo, halo accrete matter, so the galaxies forming in this halo will accrete matter, but the main difference uh, between the galaxy and the halo is that uh, the fuel for galaxy formation, for star formation, is gas, and, and gas can cool and heat. And this will make uh, the baryon distribution to decouple from the dark matter distribution in the, in, within the halo, um, in the nonlinear. Um, uh, okay, so this is a sketch of uh, a halo with a galaxy in it. Um, so this background uh, density distribution is from a night oscillation actually. Um, and you see that this galaxy is actually. Has, so these filaments which penetrate within the dark matter halo. Um, and so gas can cool, and the cooling is more efficient if the gas uh, distribution is denser. So as it cools, it becomes denser, and it will cool even more as it is denser, until some point where it is dense enough to fragment and start uh, forming star. Okay? Um, start burning and, and forming from stars. And this is how we form galaxies, really broadly speaking. Um, and then I say that can, gas can heat as well, so it can be gravitationally shock heated at the, at the edge of this uh, dark matter halo, we we'll discuss this tomorrow, uh, but also heated by uh, process like supernova feedback or agent feedback. So I think we will, will have some lectures for this next week, so I will not enter uh, really deep in the details. But just think that these processes are highly nonlinear, so they involve a high density uh, regime. Um, there are many things which are still unclear, in particular related to feedback. And um, they are also connected, um, uh, all connected, so it's very difficult to follow them analytically, so to follow them uh, properly. We run hydrodynamical simulation. Um, so here is an example of why simulations. This is the horizon edge simulation. Are there people who knew this simulation before here? No. Uh, do some people know about TNG or yeah, okay, or Eagle? Maybe. Okay. So not, not many people. Okay. Um, but anyway, so what you see here. This is a small part of the simulation. So this is the same simulation uh, that the one I sh for which I showed the visualization at the beginning in my first slide. What we see here is the gas. So greenish colors encode the gas density. Bluish color is the temperature, and red is the metallicity. And these yellow points are the galaxies. And here we have a zoom version where we see only the stellar uh, distribution in some uh, um, optical and infrared filters. And here we are likely to look at another of the cosmic waves. You can see that several filaments converging towards this region, this high density region. Um, so it's very really interesting to look at some uh, nice filaments here, and you see really tall galaxies which are flowing. Um, within these filaments. And it's nice also to see these hot gas bubbles. Um, 
in the high density regions, and which are uh, probably a combination of gas uh, shock heating and also uh, probably ADN feedback, which heats the gas. And if we look at the stellar uh, distribution here, we could trace by eye some filament. Um, but actually, if we, if we would look only at that, we could not really guess that those galaxies and those ones that might uh, reside in filaments which may be different temperature um, of, or maybe a vorticity content. Um, and in fact, the, depending on the properties of the gas uh, in the filament those galaxies are in, we might guess that uh, then we have different these, these different properties of the gas, we have different manifestations in the properties of the galaxy themselves, in their colors, in their morphologies. Uh, just a quick overview of the diversity of galaxy population, because this is what we are going to, to investigate in the context of the cosmic web. So this is the sequence. Uh, I'm sure you all have seen this plot. This is just a classification of galaxies without any chronological ordering, actually, um, as a function of their morphology. So this number here uh, is uh, related to the ellipticity of the galaxy. Um, and in fact, those galaxies here are, are those which are dispersion dominated, so the main um, support of the, those uh, galaxies is the uh, velocity dispersion, while those ones are more rotation dominated, like object. Another um, important description of galaxies is through their color. And what you see here uh, is the color, color diagram. So we look at the difference of the magnitude um, of the galaxy in uh, bands. So, in, so the difference in two bands is the color, and the plot one color against the other. Um, this uh, N, N -V -R -J color diagram is classical diagram, we will uh, see at some other point in the lecture, and it's um, widely used to separate the star-forming population of galaxies, which is located in this part of the diagram, from the passive population. Okay, if we compare, so here the color coding of the diagram is just the number of galaxies, but if we look at the specific star formation rate, we indeed see that those galaxies which are located here, they have very low uh, stellar formation. Okay. Uh, specific star formation rate is an indicator of how much uh, the stellar mass is formed per year and per stellar mass in the galaxy. While those here, well, they have a high specific star formation rate. And here we have this kind of high modality in the um, population of galaxies. We have this population of passive one and this population of star forming one, with a quite clean separation between them. And the question which naturally arises is, um, first, what, what sustains the star formation in the galaxy? And then, what uh, extinguishes, what quenches the star formation in the galaxy? So we have several uh, suspects for that. I, told, I talked about um, supernova feedback, stellar feedback, and agent outflows, um, which will uh, either eject gas out of the galaxy or heat it. So this is possible suspect. Um, then I talked about this uh, tidal field and the impact of the density, and this is also another uh, possible suspect, so which is in the large scale environment. Um, so here is a very uh, rough sketch of it. Uh, in the case of uh, a halo here, and here we have another density, um, uh, both will be in competition for accreting matter, basically. Okay, and uh, the bigger, I mean, the denser stream uh, tend to win. Then we can also question the focus of the gas outside uh, the galaxies. So either if the gas actually is not cold when it flows within the halo, but it might be shocked at the edge, this is a possibility. Another possibility is that the gas is hot. Um, 
everywhere in the environment of these halos, everywhere in the cosmic filaments. And this might also uh, happen in some cases. Uh, but most likely, quenching is a combination of uh, some of these processes, if not all. And what we don't know yet is um, uh, which process is important at which, I mean, what is, which process dominates uh, depending on the, on the epoch um, and the relative strength of this process. And to understand them, well, we need to relate galaxies to the uh, host halo first, and then relate galaxies to the uh, large scale environment. And as you can see on this sketch, um, I mean, it's only about gas here, okay? So galaxies accrete gas, gas is ejected, etc. So we, we really need to understand the properties of the gas um, in the intergalactic medium and then in the circumgalactic medium and the connection between both uh, to understand actually the properties of the galaxies. <clears throat> okay, so let's first relate galaxies to him. So I think that Hank uh, talked about uh, the Hill model a bit this morning. Um, so it's a statistical method to relate uh, galaxies to the host halo in observation uh, under some assumption like a halo mass function, toward correlation function, um, halo occupation model, so how galaxies occupy the, the dark uh, water halo. And then we measure the galaxy mass function in observation, the toggle correlation function, and we statistically connect halo to galaxy. And we can say that, on average, um, at a given halo mass, what will be the, for example, the mass of the galaxy residing in this halo? Okay, so this is the stellar to halo mass ratio plot, which is shown here. So this is the result from observation. These are data from the cosmos field. I will present this field later. And the different colors are for different redshifts. And we can make several uh, observations looking at this plot. Well, we can look at uh, this ratio. Um, basically, that we can uh, we can say that the stellar to halo mass ratio is the quantification of the star formation efficiency. And we can say that it's actually quite low. Okay. Then um, we can look at this peak where the star formation, so the galaxy mass assembly is the most efficient. And we can see that galaxies assemble their mass most efficiently at a particular halo mass, which is quite stable as a function of redshift. Maybe it shifts towards higher halo mass at higher redshift, but the hero bars here in observation are quite large, so it's, it's a bit difficult to say. So what's, uh, what are the uh, process responsible for the low star formation efficiency at low mass and at high mass? Well, um, the classical uh, process which are uh, invocated are those ones. So here we have uh, Stellar feedback in low mass galaxies, and they are in low mass galaxies. Those low mass galaxies, they are in low mass uh, halos, so the depth of the gravitational potential, I mean, the gravitational potential well is not very deep, okay? And therefore, um, this uh, supernova, for example, supernova explosion will be quite efficient at pushing the gas and heating it, okay? And pushing it into the particle. Um, but as the halo is more massive, uh, the process, the supernova, um, Feedback is less and less efficient. But something takes over at higher mass, which is uh, these active galactic nuclei um, at the center of the galaxy, which can also push the gas out of the galaxy and eat it. So these are the uh, main suspects. Um, but then you can see that at a given halo mass, there is a large scatter in this relation. Okay? And we can wonder if uh, what drives this scatter, is it just stochasticity, or is there an additional effect which is not shown on this plot which could drive this scatter? And maybe we can think that um, instead of looking in, uh, only at the halo environment, we can look a bit further and look at the uh, overall amplitude of the local density, as I discussed before, and how it, it will modulate this relation. Um, 
this is shown here. So actually, this is not a published result. This is just a quick check in, in a simulation. Um, but already, it gives an ID. Uh, the different lines here are the different uh, uh, corresponds to the relation um, per bin of local density, but looking at a scale a bit larger than the scale of the halo. So the darker color here is for low density, while the whiter is for high density. And there seems to be an influence of the local density at a scale larger than the halo on this relation, but that's not trivial, okay? It's not that one relation is always on above the other. Um, there is a, here they cross, okay? And the behavior at low halo mass is different than the behavior at high halo mass. Um, in observation, making this uh, investigation is very difficult, okay? Already having a robust stellar to relation is not trivial because you need good redshift, uh, photometric redshift measurement or spectroscopic redshift measurement. You need a large volume of data. So that's not trivial. And then if you start binning uh, by density, so you reduce the statistics in each density bin and you might get huge error bar and not be able to, to see that, okay? So this is a quite difficult measurement to, to perform. But so this is an indication that density also play a role. So how people have uh, investigated this in the uh, in, in the observation? So we started to wonder about the relation between the galaxies and their local environment a long time ago already. There was some hint in that in the, in the works by Hubble, and then a very well-known paper is the paper by Dressler in, in 1980, where he looked look at the morphology of galaxies as a function of the density. Uh, so what we see here is the fraction of galaxy as a function of the surface density. So this is seen in projection uh, onto the sky, but all the galaxies are in the local universe. And um, this uh, dashed region here, arch region here, corresponds to the late type galaxies, so the rotation dominated galaxies, maybe the spiral one, okay? And we see that they have a preference for uh, lower uh, density environment, while the dispersion dominated galaxies, the elliptical kind of galaxies, and other preference for high density environment. Beyond morphology, this uh, kind of um, preference of more evolved galaxies for high density have, seen all, have been seen also in colors. Here we look at the red sequence, so those galaxies which are slightly, I mean, which are quenched actually, uh, which are passive, uh, more likely elliptical. Um, they the red sequence, the fraction of galaxies in the red sequence is higher in high density environment. Um, the different colors in this plot correspond to different stellar mass beam. So this is something which is uh, seen at all, mass, at all masses. So we can keep this in mind. Um, in dense environment, we have more massive, redder, more concentrated, uh, less gas rich uh, galaxies. So dense environment is a bit vague, okay? There are people uh, use different uh, definition for the density. So for example, they can uh, look at the, the distance to the next galaxy, and if this distance is smaller, then it means that the environment is, is denser. Also, they compute a um, uh, smooth version of the density field by smoothing the galaxy distribution, the, the measure the amplitude of the density. So there are, there are different definitions, but this is a result which is relatively robust, at least in the recent universe for low redshift. Now, people have, as uh, time uh, was going, then we have deeper observation. We can make this measurement at higher redshift, and also we can use uh, hydro simulation to make the same, uh, the same kind of analysis. And here is the result from the TNG which is another big simulation. I talked about Horizon before, TNG is another one. And what we see here is that um, at high redshift, okay, so 
let me uh, explain the axis first. This is the specific star formation rate. We have seen this before. This is a quantification of the amount of star formation in the galaxy as a function of density. So at low redshift, there is some of this, so the red line, this is a classical result that the amount of star formation in galaxy is lower in high density environment than in uh, low density one. But at high redshift, they, they seem to be a reversal of this relation with the star formation rate, the star formation in galaxy being uh, higher in high density environment than low density one. So there seems to be some processes here. So the, the, the interpretation of the, the host of this paper is the following. So mm, at high redshift, the so galaxies are in dust environment, galaxies are well clustered, and because this is an over density, it accretes gas efficiently. And because of the um, high clustering of those galaxies, the interactions are more frequent, and this interaction can uh, trigger star formation to some extent. And the interpretation of these people is that well, those galaxies will consume their gas uh, more quickly than in low density environment. And at low redshift, they have no gas anymore and they, they become passive. Um, this is in simulation. There are also some paper uh, showing this in observational data. So this seems to be a, a solid result, although uh, very high redshift haven't been checked yet. So maybe the, the interpretation uh, that I just mentioned is the uh, right one, maybe it's, it's, it's solid. Uh, maybe we need also to go one step further in order to understand this reversal of the star formation rate density relation. And look at not only the amplitude of the local density, but as I discussed in the beginning, at the geometry of this uh, density distribution. <coughs> and this is what people have uh, started to do when they uh, look at the cosmic wave in observational data. So this is one uh, of the first uh, cosmic wave representation in observational data by de la Parma et al. here. So Rien has already uh, shown this plot. And um, this is uh, with more data uh, on the, in the SDSS. And then we have been able to make deeper surveys, so going to look at this at higher redshift, and numerical simulations so at the uh, cosmic wave also in, um, to mimic this cosmic wave in, with our computers. Um, and the rest of my talk will discuss this cosmic wave environment for, for galaxies. Uh, do we have questions so far on what I have presented here? If not, I will continue. So, we saw that the large scale cosmic web impact the formation of the halo, and we saw that halo are related to galaxy. So, because of this, we, will see, we expect to see the dependency of galaxy properties on the large scale cosmic web. Um, but then, as I already mentioned, um, maybe the properties of the gas itself depend on the cosmic, in the intergalactic medium, depend on the cosmic wave environment. And this might have also a direct implication on the properties of the galaxies here. Okay, so these are two different uh, passes, okay? It, we can measure a um, correlation between galaxies and the cosmic wave simply because of the correlation between galaxies and halo. But we can measure something at given halo mass. Okay, we can measure an impact of the cosmic wave on galaxy, and th in this case, this might be driven uh, by the properties, by the bionic physics, so the properties of the gas in the, in the cosmic wave. There are several challenges here. Um, how to properly define the cosmic wave environment in data, or even in simulation, what's the correct definition? Um, and which relation will be truly um, causal? So that's a small uh, kind of break. What I will show here is uh, a visualization of the, uh, an, another simulation, a very big one. This is a light cone, uh, um, simulated light cone called the HF5. This is a Korean collaboration. 
And we will fly through this light cone. So we see the galaxy and we see also the hot gas um, across these galaxies, uh, around these galaxies. And uh, okay, it's not happening smoothly because maybe of the collision, but anyway. And looking at this, uh, we can say that an easy tr tracer for the cosmic web will be simply the galaxy distribution. Okay. So let's look at observational probes of the cosmic web. Um, so Rin also presented this, so it's, it was a nice introduction. So what I said, so when we talk about cosmic web, I will uh, discuss about properties with respect to filament, but also with respect to node, etc. So this is just the definition of this um, component. Um, most of the results I will show are based on the dispersed code. You have heard about other codes before. There are many codes to describe the cosmic web based on different uh, tracers, either the tidal field or the density, um, which, um, or the velocity shear, etc. And different technical methods like machine learning, um, topological analysis, etc. Um, I will say that which code is used does not really matter for what I will say uh, in the following. I will just try to give you an idea of, uh, of the correlation that we found. And then uh, if you are interested in it, you can look in the technical details in more details. Um, so what we see here is the density field. So it's a 2D field, okay? The third dimension here simply encodes the amplitude of the density. And what we call nodes, they are the maxima of the density field. And these maxima uh, are uh, connected by field lines, so following the gradient here, that we call the filaments. And the void corresponds to the minima of, of the density field. So we have different props of the large-scale uh, density field distribution to extract the cosmic web. At low redshift, we can rely on the spectroscopic data. Uh, I showed the, the figure by the Laparan and I showed the SDSS. All of these are spectroscopic surveys. Um, that's very nice, but with spectroscopic data, uh, we are somehow limited in terms of volume that we can cover, or in terms of sampling, or in terms of redshift we can reach. So we can also rely on photometric data. Um, I will explain what this is for those who are not uh, familiar with observation. And at even higher redshift, we can use another probe, which is the Lyman alpha probes. So these different probes um, might have different bias. So for example, uh, the gas will, will not trace the dark matter field in the same way as galaxy traces, for example. They will have different selection functions, different uncertainties, which makes that we need to be careful when we compare uh, different results. So let's start with the spectroscopic re reconstruction of the cosmic web, and this is mostly at low redshift. So what we measure in observation for each galaxy is the angular coordinates on the sky and the redshift. And then we can, we can map these coordinates onto um, the co-moving coordinates, so um, Cartesian grid, basically, um, assuming cosmological model. Um, that's very nice, but there is one difficulty which is the peculiar velocity of the galaxy, which will cause distortion. Okay, so for example, if we look at um, a high density region, that, okay, so we will look at this in the high density region, there is the observer here, and this is the direction of the redshift. And there is a point here, A, and a point here, B, okay? And if this uh, A and B are not moving, then we will measure uh, the redshift of the point um, A, so I will call it OPS, it will be smaller than the redshift of B. But then maybe um, this over density is collapsing, okay, and there will be a huge uh, peculiar motion of A and B. And therefore, uh, in this case, 
so the velocity of the, along the line of sight of A will be positive and B will be negative. And ZA ops, this will be the cosmological redshift uh, plus VA over C, okay, which is the redshift, the peculiar redshift of the galaxy. And same for B. Uh, and depending on the uh, respective um, velocity of A and B, and if this velocity is high, are high, actually what we can see is not a nice spherical overdensity, but an, an elongated uh, overdensity. Okay? So this is what we call the finger of God effect. And this is super strong, especially uh, near cluster. So here is an example. This is from a simulation. The 300 simulation, which is a simulation of cluster. This is the distribution of galaxy without um, accounting for this uh, finger of God effect. And the black lines are the filaments that we could extract from this distribution of galaxy. And here is the same, but um, when uh, the finger of God effect has been uh, included in the data. And you see that we have this huge elongation here along the line of sight. And this is the problem if we want to extract the filaments because all the time we believe that there is a filament in this direction, okay? Well, actually, uh, there, there might be not. And in cluster, this is complicated because uh, there is, um, well, the galaxies have a peculiar uh, velocity dispersion within the cluster. But also we have uh, this galaxy flowing along the filament, which will add complexity to the um, velocity field uh, in the cluster. Um, so we have a way to statistically correct for this finger of God effect in large data. Here is an example of this correction. So this is uh, measurement by Katarina Krajnik in the gamma survey. And here you see the distribution of galaxies. So this is observation, okay? with the figure of God, and uh, these color regions correspond to the identification of groups. Um, this is nice anisotropic identification, and you see that all the groups in the field, they are elongated due to, due to this figure of God effect. And then, well, we can make this anisotropic identification of group, and then compress those groups, and um, by statistically compressing it, um, we can clean a bit the distribution of galaxy, uh, make a better extraction of the cosmic wave after this cleaning. So here is an example of the cosmic wave extraction in the gamma field, um, which is a relatively large field, okay, at low redshift. What we see in black um, are the filaments and these color regions correspond to the wall which have also been extracted from this data. And this is a very nice visualization here. Um, here is another example in the Vipers field. Um, and this is, so the Vipers field is at, is at higher redshift, okay, we, this reconstruction was done up to redshift 0.85. Um, and again, what you see, the green lines here are the filaments as identified by the structure finder code. So a brief recap of the spectroscopic sample for the cosmic wave extraction. Um, it's very nice because with SpecZ we can make a 3D reconstruction, provided we correct for the finger of God effect, uh, which is not an easy task to do, especially if the statistic uh, is low, if, if the field is small. Um, but spectra are costly, and therefore we are limited if we want to probe higher redshift or lower masses. Uh, so here is an overview of current um, uh, upcoming surveys uh, with SpecZ that we could use to reconstruct the cosmic wave. What is plotted here is the mean intergalaxy distance in a megaparsec as a function of redshift. So this is basically the resolution at which we can uh, extract the structure or study the environmental effect um, as a function of redshift. And so I talked about gamma, about SDSS, about Vipers. Soon, hopefully, we will have Euclid, which, with which we will have a SpecZ sample as well. Um, there will be a SpecZ sample with W first, and PFS is also coming soon. Okay. 
but you see that this part of the plot is not covered because this is the difficult part. Okay, this is the the part where we would have a large sampling, so small intergalactic distance, and at high redshift. Okay, and if we want to study the evolution of the process shaping galaxy formation as a function of redshift, we want also to probe the high redshift. So this is where photometry can help. Um, so I will briefly explain what photometric redshift are, because maybe some of you are purely theoretician and you don't know photometric redshift. So let's assume that we don't observe uh, the spectra for each galaxy, but instead of this, we observe part of the sky with a certain filter passband. Um, and actually, if we have a lot of filter passband, that will help. So here you have the Cosmos filter baseline. And it's nice because we have many filters which cover well the electromagnetic spectrum of um, the galaxy we are looking at. So we measure the flux for uh, all the galaxies in these bands. So we will get some point corresponding to each band. And looking at this, well, by eye you could trace what is the <coughs> spectrum of this galaxy, okay? You will trace that. Um, so actually, this is how we compute photometric redshift. We fit the photometric data with template. Um, so each template is built uh, assuming some stellar library, some star formation history of the galaxy, some dust models. There is a lot of modeling here. And then we redshift um, all the library of templates at different redshift step. And then we look at which templates uh, match the best the data. And here, the best fit template for these galaxies will be at, at redshift uh, 2. So actually, this feature here will be the band of break, I guess, um, and which is useful uh, to, to identify the redshift of the galaxy. Actually, usually we don't use only the best fit redshift, but we, we look at the distribution of the redshift, the PDF of the redshift for each, uh, which is built with all the templates, and then we can take what's the, for example, the median redshift and what's the uncertainty of the redshift of this galaxy. And then for each galaxy, we get a redshift and a redshift uncertainty. So this is very nice. If we have a large enough survey, we can compute the redshift for all the galaxies and try to make uh, an extraction of the cosmic wave because then we have the angular coordinate and the redshift so we can, we can see how to, uh, um, what it gives. Um, so what I will show is for the cosmos field. Uh, I talked about it a bit before. Cosmos field is a two square degree field on the sky. Uh, this is the apparent size of the moon on the sky. So the cosmos field is about uh, 10 times the size of the moon. Um, this is not that large, okay, at redshift 1, uh, the edge of the cosmos field is, I mean, one edge of the field would be about uh, 100 coming megaparsec. So this is not super large, uh, but this is large enough to extract the cosmic rep, okay? This is la much larger than the typical size of the void, for example, which can be a good indicator. So this is what we would have with uh, the true data if there were no redshift error. This is what we have if there are the typical photometric redshift error. Okay, so the photometric redshift error had a huge confusion along the line of sight. Uh, then, okay, here I show what is shown on this plot is in the configuration of Cosmos, what's the um, lens I mean, the confusion lens along the line of sight driven by the photometric redshift error. So for galaxies at mass of 10 to the 10 solar mass, uh, at the redshift o, um, I don't know, at the redshift 1 here, this uh, blue line, the typical confusion lens along the line of sight is a bit, is like 80 megaparsec. This is super large, actually. So we cannot make a 3D extraction with this data, okay? But we can do something else, and what we can do is to consider thick redshift slices, which is shown here. Uh, we can calibrate the thickness of the slice on the typical redshift uncertainty, so make it large enough so that we, uh, it's larger than the, this uncertainty. 
and then we can stack all the, the galaxies in this slice and extract the cosmic web from the density field in 2D, okay? Now, uh, given its photometric redshift uncertainty, each galaxy will have a certain probability to contribute to the density uh, of this slice. So actually what we can do, which is shown here, is that we can make multiple localization um, of the cosmic wave extraction by sampling under uh, the probability distribution function of the redshift of the galaxies. And here is an example. Okay, so the different lines in blue correspond to different uh, realization of the cosmic wave extraction by sampling under the PDF of Z. And that's nice to do this because then we can see which filaments uh, are robust and which one are probably fake uh, detection. Uh, here I show multiple realization of the same slice. So these are multiple cosmic wave extraction, um, but uh, yeah, it's all for the same slice. And you see that there are some features which uh, appear most of the time. Uh, for example, here, we have this one here as well, which is often there. Um, and so this is the result, okay? And doing that, we can also put a typical uncertainty on the filament width uh, driven by the photometric redshift uncertainty. So this is also a nice way to quantify the error from the uh, cosmic wave extraction. Okay, so time is flying out. So um, here is a small recap of the asset and um, difficulties of the cosmic web extraction with photometric redshift. So, I mean, the advantage is that we can work on large field uh, relatively quickly uh, up to high redshift, but then we have to work in 2D, which might limit the investigation because of projection effect. And the future is bright because then we will have soon Euclid, so very wide field, um, but also the Rubin telescope of, of the Roman one. But still, given the photometric redshift uncertainty, it will be difficult to go beyond redshift 2. So before uh, finishing today, I will present you a last tracer. I mean, there are others, but uh, I will make the focus on this one. Um, the last tracer of the cosmic wave, which is based on the Lyman Alpha Forest, <coughs> and which allows to go uh, at redshift above two. So I guess you have you have a lecture on the Lyman Alpha Forest, uh, but here I will just apply it to the cosmic wave reconstruction. So uh, let's assume that you have some background sources here, which are relatively bright, and for which you can observe uh, the spectra. And in front of these sources, you have clouds of uh, neutral hydrogen. And basically, these clouds, they follow the cosmic wave. Okay? This is the intergalactic medium. And they will, they will absorb the light uh, in the background spectra at the Lyman alpha wavelengths. But because of the redshift between the background sources and the cloud, um, this uh, absorption feature will appear at different positions in the uh, spectra of the background sources, and this is what is shown here. All these absorption lines correspond to absorption uh, at the Lyman alpha wavelengths, the rest frame of the cloud, okay? And so this is what we call the Lyman alpha forest. And now, um, if we, we, we have a lot of background sources, what we can do is that we can interpolate between the line of sight and um, make a 3D reconstruction of the field. So what we measure here in the flux, basically we measure the transmitted flux, and this transmitted flux is a tracer of the neutral hydrogen density. So we can uh, broadly reconstruct what is the neutral hydrogen density between the sources and us. Um, I will skip this. I will show you one of these reconstructions in the Clamato field, which is uh, a field on the, in the cosmos, again. Then what has been done here is that a certain number of targets have been observed um, with a spectrograph. And then they have performed this 3D reconstruction. So this is a small movie to show you uh, how these things are done. Okay, so if we have one sight line, we probe a certain number of clouds. And then we can add uh, more sight lines. 
um, just. It's kind of a smooth thing between the cyclines, basically. And in the, this uh, Clamato survey, they have 124 cyclines. So they can yeah, recover this volume. And this is true data. So this is very nice because, well, we can see by high, although the, the smoothing scale is relatively large, but we can see by high the nodes and um, filaments connecting uh, those nodes. <coughs> okay. So here is a still version of the same uh, visualization. The white dots here correspond to galaxies, and they, this team also correlates the galaxies with the cosmic wave extracted with the Lemon Alpha Forest tomography. Um, so this field is relatively small, which might be a problem if we were, want to make a conclusion, for example, on the correlation between galaxies and the cosmic wave. Um, but then we will have a future survey. So here I show some forecast for mosaic on the ELT. So mosaic will um, be in a very long time. Uh, this is the second generation instrument on the ELT. And the ELT is not there yet, but it is under construction. And what I will show you is only a forecast from simulation. We mimicked a mosaic-like survey. And given the coverage, uh, wavelength coverage of the mosaic instrument, what we can do is to probe the density field at redshift larger than 3. What you see here is a spectrum of galaxy. The black here is the Lyman Alpha Forest. This is without noise, but then obviously we will have uh, noise. This, um, this corresponds to the orange line here. Um, and something which needs to be investigated is which amount of noise is tolera tolerated so that we can still reconstruct the cosmic wave from this kind of survey. Um, and if you want to reduce the noise, then you will to expose, to observe this target for a longer amount of time. So you need to find a good compromise between uh, observation time and, um, and signal to noise ratio. And in this paper, we, we made the prediction that to what is needed is to have signal to noise ratio of about 5 in the Lemon Alpha Forest, um, which requires to observe one degree, one square degree field to observe during uh, 90 nights, so this is not eligible. Um, and these are just some uh, examples of the reconstruction. So we are between ratio 3 and 3.6. This is the original field, and here are the reconstructed field with different signal to noise ratio on the, on the spectra. So there is not only mosaic planned, uh, we have other surveys. Uh, what is shown here is the mean distance between cyclines. So this is an equivalent on the mean of the mean intergalactic distance that I showed before in the case of galaxy survey. As of, um, here is the volume. So the best is to have a large volume and a small distance between cyclines to reconstruct the field at, at high density. Um, but this part of the plot is difficult to cover, okay? So soon we will have the data by the weave spectrograph. Uh, the first light will be this full, probably. And uh, this is where the Clamato survey I just showed light, so it has a good resolution, but good resolution, but a small volume. Finally, um, I will discuss this in more details tomorrow, but we have other tracers of the cosmic wave and we can observe the cosmic wave, the gas, gaseous cosmic wave, but in emission. What I showed is absorption, we can also observe it in emission. Um, and here what you see is uh, the upper deep field, and I will overlay on that the Lyman alpha emission observed by the MUSE um, instrument, if you. And you see that uh, gas is everywhere uh, on these galaxies, and this gas 
uh, can be used, I mean, this emission can be used to, to extract the cosmic web as well. Um, two years ago, already, uh, there was this paper by Daddy et al. I, um, I mean, there, there might be more recent paper, um, but it shows uh, some filaments connecting here to an overdensity. Okay, so this is a nice illustration of what is possible to do uh, to extract the cosmic wave in Neyman alpha emission. But again, this is um, with um, IFU, so this is quite costly to observe very large volume. Uh, at least with, with the new uh, instrument here. Okay. Um, should I do, should I? Maybe I should just stop. I will, maybe I think I will go towards this part tomorrow because it's already 10 minutes before the end. Um, so, before finishing and uh, taking your question, I can show this. I, I'm sure you have seen this image. This is uh, one of the first images uh, released by the GW, uh, making public, uh, taken by the GWST. Um, we can wonder, does GWST have something, has, uh, have something to say about cosmic web and, and cosmic web uh, studies? Um, so there is this program, GWST program on Cosmos, again, um, which is called Cosmos Web and which has been accepted as a Cycle 1 program. So actually this is the largest Cycle 1 program with GWST. Um, so this is a treasury program, meaning that the data will be uh, released relatively soon after they have been taken, like maybe nine months or one year, uh, I don't remember. And it will not observe the total of all the cosmos field, just 0.6 square degree, but this is already quite large. So this is very nice. And we will observe it in four near-cam bands and one Milky bands. Um, so in photometry. And this is uh, great because on Cosmos we have this uh, large amount of data already, of photometric data. We have some spectra, etc. So we can build on this um, to make very great science with uh, this Cosmos web program. And in particular, because we have a large field, then uh, we can make some environmental studies. Um, at least probe the spatial distribution of ionization, uh, maybe measure the effect of environment on uh, galaxy growth at very, very high redshift, so I mean redshift 4 and, and above. Um, and also, because this is a relatively large field, we can catch some uh, relatively rare objects, like uh, massive galaxies, and we can study the formation of massive galaxies at high redshift. Uh, and if some of you are looking for postdocs in the near future, uh, we got money to hire um, two postdocs uh, working on uh, GWST related stuff, so we Cosmos Web Data. Um, so that will be to work with uh, Olivier Hilbert at LAM, uh, and Andrew McCracken in Paris, myself, and other people in these two labs. I mean. um, so one postdoc position in Paris, and one in Marseille, one in Marseille uh, will be to work on um, data, data analysis mostly and the one in Paris on hydro simulation to interpret the data at this redshift. So if you have questions on this, please don't hesitate to discuss with me. Okay, then I have a question. Hi, thank you for the uh, nice talk. Uh, so you mentioned about the reversal of the star formation rate density relation yes. when we come from yes. the high redshift to low redshift. And 
We already know that uh, stellar mass is also tightly correlated with environment where we see uh, more massive galaxies in the higher, denser environment. Mm -hmm. So does it mean that when we go to higher redshift, uh, whether the stellar mass environment relation also changes or does, what, what changes there? Does the relation between the star formation rate and stellar mass changes? Yeah, this is a good point. Um, so in, uh, we always found that like, more massive galaxies are in general uh, in denser environment. Um, so I think this relation does not change with redshift, but um, this might be related to the fact that at high redshift, the galaxy grow quickly more massive, and then they will crunch because of uh, maybe they consume the gas. But then the lower mass galaxies in low density environment, even if they don't crunch, they don't touch up. Uh, I guess the, the more massive ones. So I guess the stellar mass density relation is relatively robust across cosmic time. Ah, okay, okay. But I guess the slope of the relation might evolve and might tell us something about the stellar mass assembly story. Um, okay. Also, uh, what about the effect of uh, interactions when we go to very small uh, scales? Yeah. Uh, uh, so then, in local universe, even though we have less star formation in denser environments, if we go to very small uh, uh -huh. scales, we still can see an enhancement in the star yes. formation rates, right? Yes. So that is like, you know, is it due to the interactions that we have? Or, uh, yes. So. Um, so I think there is an agreement on the literature, but I guess Jeremy Finch will talk next week will be able to comment more on that. But there is an agreement that at least in the short term, interaction will enhance star formation, but the behavior on the long term um, is probably uh, the opposite, so in the long term this uh, galaxy might crunch. Uh, I will talk a bit about this later because uh, interaction might also boost the agent feedback activity and then quench the galaxies on the long term. But that's not a trivial uh, question, I guess. And the answer is not trivial as well. Okay, thank you.